Hey everyone, it is Tuesday, the new home of Kramer Corner. Welcome to episode two. Very happy to be back. We've moved our show from the Friday evening, which, which, which we had last week. Aviation Gear TV is going to remain on Fridays. We've now made a permanent home for Kramer Corner, Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific. And I'm joined tonight by Phoenix Vandervaden, Kramer artist. We're going to have a great discussion. How are you tonight, Phoenix? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. It's great to be here. It's nice to have you, and uh, you know I've been a fan of your channel for quite some time. I'm a subscriber, and it's really cool getting to see some of the things you do out there. You're doing a, a lot of great tributes to uh, some of these artists that we all talk about on the show, from the Joe Satriani's to the Eddie Van Halen's to Steve Vai, everything in between. So it, it's really, really cool to get a different perspective on it and uh, some of the lessons that you provide as well, too. So I think it's going to be a good show tonight, and people that haven't discovered your channel yet um, are in for a treat for sure. And I want to remind everyone that we have all your links down below. Hello, and my better, my, uh, better half, uh, Nocturnal Butterfly, will be posting uh, links throughout the evening as well, too, to your different entities. So just really happy to have you here. So, so how you been? And maybe give us a little bit of a background on yourself for people that may not know you. Uh, kind of tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up and when you got into guitar and just a little bit more about yourself. Well, I was actually born in Rio de Janeiro by Greek parents. And I started playing guitar at the age of nine. I actually grew up with an interest in already in 80s guitars and, and 80s music because my parents were huge fans of Van Halen and bands like Tesla and Motley Crue. So we, I was always listening to this, this type of, of music at home. So I developed that interest in, at, a very, at a very early age. So. It wasn't uncommon when I reached home from school and there I was listening to Fair Warning in 1984 and these great, great classics. So the turning point for me actually was when I watched it live without a net by Van Halen. It sounded so cool live, so great. And I saw him so happy playing his guitar and making that audience go wild. <laughs> And they said, whoa, I got to give it a shot one day, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's a magical thing to make people happy through me, through music. And he managed that on his career. He did. It, it, it's absolutely amazing. And like you say, too, the smiles, the happiness, you know, uh, seeing people have uh, fun. Paul Gilbert was like that on the show recently, too. You're watching him play. And, you know, it just makes guitar fun, even though, you know, some of us may not be able to play like Paul Gilbert. But when you see a person playing and smiling and how guitar is just so much fun, like, and he even used the word, as, uh, all of us as musicians, whether we're guitar players, bass players, keyboard players, you know, saxophonists, whatever, we are our own jukeboxes. So that's one of the advantages we as musicians have over some of the other people that, you know, if there's no radio around or you don't know the lyrics to something, we can just play some music and we are our own entertainment and jukebox. And Paul Gilbert also is so innovative on what he does. And he does it having so much fun. He provides joy to people in a music style that people take it too much serious nowadays, right? That's right. Because shred, shred guitar is supposed to be fun. It's, it's supposed to, to show off what you do, but of course you you got to have fun yeah. and reach that fun to the public, to people. <laughs> You have to for sure. And not that I meant to get down the rabbit hole of Paul Gilbert, but I saw a really cool post today on, on social media, on Instagram from Paul. And I think, don't quote me this, but I think he's over in Chile right now doing a, a tour uh, with Mr. Big or maybe it's a clinic. I forget which. Yeah, actually, I think it's a Mr. Big show. But um, he's he's so dedicated to his students. And we're going to talk about your students later on in the program tonight, too, how you connect with your students but he is so involved in these artist work students that they pay these monthly memberships. He never wants to be away from them. And I saw wherever he is right now, it's extremely hot. He's backstage at an event and he has some time, you know, between shows, whatever. And he's communicating with his students one-on-one. -on -one, and he has like his laptop set up on a chair and he's got a couple of nice lights, even, even the backstage has nice lights. And he said it was so hot that he had to take a towel and soak it in ice water and kind of pat his head a couple times in between things. But he still did it for his students. And I thought that is really remarkable that you're that dedicated to your students. That's, in my view, that's a true musician. Yeah. Because he 
worked so hard during his career to become the great musician that he is, and now he is like passing the, the torch. He's sharing his knowledge to others, and he's willing to sacrifice himself to, to do that. And it's something quite rare. It, it is. In these days, and that's why he's such an, an iconic musician. Even now, when, when the scene doesn't have much support from the media, people still look for his music, for his playing, his dedication is paying off right now. That's right. I, I agree. I'm going to jump over to the chat for a quick second, then we're going to come back and talk about some exciting news that's just recently happened for you. But over in the uh, chat, we have Ricky Mees here saying, Hey, Eric, how are things going? Les Bellin is here. Happy, uh, hello, everyone. Sean Zimmerman, hey, all. My beautiful better half nocturnal butterfly is here saying live chat. Make sure everyone's on live chat so you get the latest messages. Dan Halen is here. Sean Close. James St. Mars. There's a notification I was waiting for. And nocturnal has dropped in your YouTube channel. So everyone, please take a look at that uh, link there as well. Subscribe to it. There's some great things. I've actually even printed out some of your tablature on some of your lessons. It's very helpful. Some of the things I, I just honestly cannot play, but I still printed them out anyways. I'm going to work on them. And it's, uh, it's very encouraging. So check out that channel, everybody. Um, here's a qu the first question from the chat. Grilled chicken salad sounds like new to the, um, uh, the channel. Phoenix, what do you think about the Tone Vice pitch shifter? Are you familiar with that pedal? Oh, not yet. Not okay. yet. I read some great reviews about it. And I actually use a pitch shifter myself because I have my guitars all tuned st st standard. Okay. <laughs> so it's a quite useful tool for me, but I use a Digitech one. Okay. I haven't used this one yet. So that's the thing, too. A lot of pedals out there do pitch shifting really well, but sometimes it's more independent strings. You know, like, uh, you know, they don't poly, they're not polyphonic. They won't transpose a whole chord. So uh, yes. I'm not even familiar with that one. So I'll, I'll have to look that one up myself. Yeah. Uh, OU812 here says, can't wait. Our friend Aljon Ghost says, hello, Kramer fans. Uh, <laughs> Nocturnal Butterfly says, oh, I love her already. Uh, Sean Close, is that a hologram Kramer on her computer? I see that thing a lot. Tell us about that little that little hologram thing you have back there. One here, that's a great friend of mine from the Netherlands. He owns a company over there. It's in Bergen. He does these handmade guitar replicas made of lead. He does any guitar you want. And he's endorsing me since 2015. Okay. And now he's working with Steve Vai and Steve Moore. So I'm super happy for him now. So he made this little replica for me of my 84. I love it. And I see a lot of those in your videos. So it's very, very cool to see that. And it draws our attention to it a lot of times. You're kind of like, what is that thing? It's very, very cool. Well, thank you. Yes, he's a genius. He can do pretty much any guitar you want, any any replica. <laughs> is it is it plastic or, or what is it? It's made of acrylic. Okay, yep. And a little LED light here on the base. Okay, I, I like that. Yeah, that's very, very cool. Yes, yes, it's super cool. Actually, later on, if you can. It's like a lot like my 84, actually, right? That is awesome. <laughs> later on, send me send me a link if if we, we can promote his uh you know if, his business sure. whatever. I'd be happy to share that with some of our guitar fans. That'd be really cool. So he'll make some custom things for for people. Yes, yes, he he does he does like plagues. He works with Steve Morse at the moment on his tour. He he can do any replica you want, Houston. Anything. Oh, very cool. Maybe even some Van Halen style guitars or things like that. Die hard Van Halen fan also. <laughs> awesome. That's very cool. Uh, so that answers Sean Close's question. Tactical Six String is here. Jeff Wilson saying enjoying the broadcast. Eric, please keep the great shows coming. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, very cool from Sean Close. Dave, do you, uh, Dave Bryan says, or Byron, I'm sorry, says, do you play classical or Spanish guitar? And I've never seen, I don't think I've seen any, you playing any acoustic or, or classical. Do you play classical a little bit? Just a, a tad bit. I actually studied, of course, I love classical music, but I started studying classical guitar because I wanted to learn how to read music and mm -hmm. get more in deep with theory. But I'm by no means a great classical player. Just <laughs> <a student. laughs> It's a fun instrument, but it's very challenging. I, I took some lessons as a child. Uh, I shouldn't say a child, a very, very young teen. 
and uh, it just wasn't for me. Like uh, obviously, a lot of things in life, if it's too hard, I tend to bail pretty quickly, <laughs> and it was pretty hard for me. <laughs> so I, I took exit stage left, and uh, I never went back to it. Understand? I was already having a hard time with a six string. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with the, exactly. With the electric guitar. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Dan Wilhite is here saying, "Yo, Eric, finally the Kramer uh, show." Sean Close, heck yeah, I'll buy one for sure. So we, I will get those links from you later on. We can share some of the business. That's great. Uh, Sean says, thanks, Eric. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of people are interested in that light already. That's really cool. That's going to be the star of the program is the light. That's awesome. Um, that's very, very cool. So I want to jump into some of the recent news, and this is really, really exciting. And, and I'm very happy to, to, to I want to congratulate you, but we're going to do that secondhand. You were just recently brought into Kramer Guitars as an artist and, and the family of artists along with all these great artists out there. I want to ask you what it felt like, you know, kind of the emotions you went through, you know, um, maybe all the years you were waiting for something like this to happen and just kind of put us in the mindset of when you found out about this and, and what it did feel like. I'm actually still pinching myself here because I, I don't believe that the folks at Kramer contacted me for an endorsement. You know, I've been playing the guitar since an early age. And of course, when I started playing, YouTube was getting big and everyone was sharing those great late, those great M MTV videos mm -hmm. from those great 80s bands. And not all, but some of, the, so, some of those great players, they were playing with a Kramer. And I saw, oh my, those guitars look so cool and, and they sound so, so awesome. And then, of course, I saw the video for Hot for Teacher. Mm -hmm. And each comes storming into that classroom playing his <laughs> Beretta, right? And I say, oh my, I gotta play with these guitars. So I got my 84, which was my first actually good guitar. And I, I've been playing it for some good six years now. I got my 85 in 2014. And like two weeks ago, the folks at Kramer contacted me on Facebook and they said, well, we share one of your videos on our page a couple of months ago. And now, what do you think of being endorsed by Rives? I said, what? <laughs> what? Am I dreaming here? What? That's right. So, right now I'm working hard here to, to make the best for the brand, of course, and I can thank them enough for giving me this opportunity. It's like a, a dream coming true. It certainly is. Well, first of all, well deserved and congratulations. And it, it is something that will probably, I, I honestly think for the rest of your life, you're probably going to pinch yourself like you said every day. It's a very surreal moment, a very cool feeling. And uh, I think I think the sky's the limit what you can do with them. I mean, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, it's nice to see the brand today alive and breathing well, not only just back, that's one thing that they're back, but they they have plans on being here for a long time. So I think anyone that might be interested in investing into the Kramer brand as far as buying guitars and hoping there's going to be support for them for many years to come, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised that they're, they are here to stay and they take the legacy that was made beforehand very, very seriously. And artists, I said this last week with Al John on the show, artists like as yourself, are very respected in the community or actually in the family of the guitars and it is a very artist driven company you mentioned eddie van halen eddie van halen certainly put the kramer on the on the the forefront of everyone's you know uh knowledge of the brand back in the day you had all your other people too like there's so many people i won't be able to mention them all but like you know vivian campbell and and all all these great guitar players out there back in the day this, the list goes on and on and on we could spend a whole hour talking about the artists but it is all surrounded around artists. So I'm very excited for you. And you've, you've got some killer guitars, as you just mentioned. So I want to mention to our fans here as well, too. Later on in the program, I was going to get you to play a couple licks uh, for us. But because you're in a time zone a few hours, quite, quite several hours ahead of us, it's quite late. And we don't want to disturb some neighbors. So I'm going to wrap this into two little segments here. I'm going to get you to show some of our fans some of the guitars that you've just talked about. Um, and then as soon as you show us a couple of guitars, tell us some stories about them. We'll start now that it's somewhat early and have you play a couple licks as long as you feel like you're warmed up and ready to go. And, and then we won't disturb any neighbors. So how about we take it away with a couple of shots of some of your cool guitars? Okay. Well, here it goes. That's my 84. You've probably seen 
be playing this one on YouTube a lot, yeah. actually. That was my first actually good guitar. This this one has an interesting story because I had to wait six months for this guitar to arrive in the mail for me. <laughs> because at the time in Brazil we have we were having a maple restrictions, so you had to go to a long process at the customs, and I was already nervous to for it to arrive. But good things demand patience, right? <laughs> so here it is. It's an excellent guitar. It's rock solid. It's completely stock, except now because I refretted after six years. I did that job on the guitar. It has a Duncan JB, mm -hmm. original Sly Rose. It, it has a maple body, one piece maple neck. It's super chunky. Sometimes I think of this guitar as a last fall meets a super strat because the body of the 84 is actually a Pacer special. Right. I'm not wrong. Yeah, but the neck is super chunky. It feels like one of those. 80s last falls by gibson nice yes it's a very cool guitar and sustained for for days i love it i use it all the time i used to play with this guitar while while on my practicing days like six seven hours per day wow <laughs> that's why i needed to refret it now <laughs> Well, I have, I have two questions. One is a question, and one re, uh, is kind of a statement. So I, I was going to ask you about the refretting job, and I'll get that to that secondly. But I don't know about this restriction on maple over with Brazil and whatnot. I, I, I know here that we have the problems with uh, rosewood and things like that. Can you share with me what the problem was with maple over, your, over that way? I don't understand that very well. I believe back in between 2013 and 2015, there were some wood restrictions here that denied the entry of maple in the country. Maple okay. and rosewood. Now I think it's just rosewood. Now they let maple enter like entry freely in in the country. Not back in the day. Gotcha. Okay, well that makes sense. And here's something I would think too. Like obviously there's probably still some stock sitting and some shelves of the uh, Kramer dealers of, you know, like the Berettas and things like that with a rosewood neck, I would think those would be something that be, if anyone's a fan of some Kramer guitars, grab those as quickly as you possibly can, right? Because, you know, things will be changing for a lot of these manufacturers. I, they are changing as we speak right now. So that would be really cool to buy. Just get it while you can in a real rosewood. So that's awesome. But yeah, you, sh you shared some things on social media where you were refretting that guitar. So you obviously played it so much that you obviously wore the frets down. Um, yeah, and you and you shared with me off the off the air that you didn't have a lot of luthiers in your area, but so tell us. I mean, first of all, a person like myself who was would never in a million years approach refretting a guitar, even though I have a couple that could use it, uh, I would never want to attempt it. I would just take it. But here in North America, or at least in Canada, I could probably drive thirty miles, and I could find several luthiers that could do the job good for me. So I'm lucky that way. But tell us how daunting of a task and how did it turn out for you approaching it and then back to a guitar that's playable again? Well, sadly here we don't have many options of luthiers. And my first guitar was an entry level guitar, but I have I had a pretty bad experience. You know, they he the guy who did the, the job for, for me, he scratched the body of the guitar, so I got a bit traumatized. So I thought with myself, well, since I'm learning how to play the instrument, so I want to learn the whole craft, you know? I want to learn, I, I want to know how to do my own setups, how to adjust the Floyd, and how to change the pickups. So at first, I started looking for some info on YouTube. YouTube is like one, one of the best, sorry, it's one of the best schools. For sure, <laughs> for sure. It did almost everything, so I learned the, ba the the basics on YouTube, like how to set up the Floyd, how to change the tuners. But then I enrolled into a luthier's course, oh, wow. where I learned the more complex stuff, like refretting the guitar and adjusting the truss rod, which used to freak me out, <laughs> but now I got it. So. I thought some, sometimes a situation may show up that I, I will need to do that. 
and I won't have a person handy to do that for me. So that's I'll fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. Having the tools available in your toolkit to be able to do that is fantastic. Like I've always said it's good to know how to solder some wires because you could be at a gig and uh, a wire pulls off the volume pot. And as much yeah. as that may seem like a very easy task for most people, just wh how do I heat this thing up and stick it back on there is a very daunting task. And none of, none of us have roadies or guitar techs with us, you know, like on the lower scale of what we do. So basic essentials like that are great. Um, I mean, you went to the extreme. I mean, I, I consider refretting a pretty talented, you know, skill set. So no, this, this course that you enrolled in, uh, how long of a deal was it? Was it like an online thing? And how long did it take you to kind of graduate or get through this course? Presential, actually. I actually graduated last month. Oh, that's oh, cool. No. That's cool. Yes. One month of experience on the streets now. <laughs> but but it was quite valid because it made me lose the fear of messing with my, with my guitar. I came to the conclusion that it's like when we first get a Floyd Rose guitar. Mm-hmm. We get scared to mess with it, right? Sure. Everyone. But after time passes, we see that it's not so hard and the Floyd is our friend. Pretty much it is with the other parts of the guitar. We just have to get used to, to it and practice and get confident to do certain stuff here. I, I think that's very cool because like, like an old friend like you said too and that's the thing people so they might get their guitar come with a Floyd Rose and it's tuned for 440 and it's like okay I like to tune down so they loosen they loosen the tension of the strings all of a sudden now the Floyd is stuck back in the body of the guitar then they got to go in and adjust those springs and then they're like oh my god I just messed up my guitar it played so good when it from the factory what do I do they're lost but once you get past that that fear factor that you know, you haven't broke your guitar. You've just you've, you're kind of in a in a rut for a second. You'd have to adjust the springs and do some other stuff. And as you learn some wiring, in your case, like learning frets, you've now kind of become one with that guitar and have a relationship with it. You, like, it sounds silly, but you have a relationship with the guitar now that you know you when it's sick, you know, or needs some attention, you know how to fix it, and it kind of responds back to you. I think a lot of times too, like you just like, it's almost like you have a a relationship with the instrument. Yes, yes. It's like a next step. You feel like it's a mission accomplished also because you play the instrument, but you also know how to deal mm -hmm. with, you, you know, the anatomy. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I, I agree with that 100%. It's almost like back in my day, not related to music, but my dad, when he would teach me about cars. I don't know I don't know lots about cars, nothing about cars other than if I had an old, like, you know, a 70s or, you know, an old car that if I was driving it today and I broke down on the side of the road, I could get it going again, you know, like it was different with cars with computers today. But you should be you should be aware at least enough of the essentials to get you out of a uh, a pinch or a, a a terrible situation that you might find yourself in. Here's an example: you might go do a gig. You've got a pedal board and a guitar and an amplifier and all kinds of power supplies and a bunch of cables. And all of a sudden, okay, three, two, one, let's go live. And you and it was working for sound check. You had a beautiful sound, and you go to hit a note and you're dead. So you need to at that moment be a superhero without the cape and troubleshoot. Okay. Guitar cable, okay, is it good? Do I have power? Is Do I have lights? Where am I coming from? So you need to be able to do, like, uh, and analyze everything in a millisecond. Yes, yes. It's good because you feel like you're prepared to handle any, any, sorry, any situation, you know? Because anything can happen, especially life. Yep. Nobody's safe. You know? Can and you usually can, will. Usually you will. And lose a string here, a string can break and... You will mess up with the full eye, so you, you're going to be prepare like a boy scout yeah. when you go well, to for, stage. <laughs> for you too, you play with most of your Floyds, um, maybe all your Floyds floating, is that correct? Yes, yes. So they yeah, you break a string okay. and you got a problem. Sorry? You break a string and you've got a problem. Yes, yeah. yes. A huge problem because yeah. lives. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to be prepared for this minor issues that may show up along the way. <laughs> yeah. I've seen some, some guitar players where they'll break a string with a Floyd and they'll actually compensate holding the bar a certain way, just close enough while they were able to get you know someone to pass them another guitar. But let's yes. jump over to your second guitar. Let's have a look what the next one is. Oh, yes, yes. That's the 85 Rich or the Barrera Vintage. Mm -hmm. so 
the in the US. This one here, it's similar, but at the same time, it's different from the 84 because the body is smaller. This one here is, I had a Planeton pickup. It's a company from Denver, okay. Colorado, that is endorsing me right now. They're great also. And I, the while the 84 has a one-piece maple neck, the 85 has a three-piece maple neck. So in some ways, and in my humble opinion, it's like playing those early 90s Ibanez guitars. Oh, they're awesome. Yes, yes, the, those classic wizard necks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the vibe I get from this guitar. The only change I made on this guitar was the pickup. All the rest is all stock. And of course, it has that very cool rosewood fretboard that I had to import as well. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's almost a year for, for it to arrive, but it's here. <laughs> but it's a beautiful guitar, and that's one that we recognize a lot too. Well, you know, Eddie Van Halen was seen in a lot of the classic advertisements, you know, the hand on the Kramer case. You know, that's yes. that's another guitar that totally w went crazy and viral back in the day before we knew what viral really meant. Viral back in the day meant, you know, everyone was talking about this advertisement in a magazine long before social media, but that, that's a beautiful guitar. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, later on, it. let me later on as well, too, send me a message off the air about uh, that pickup company, and I'll be sure to uh, share those as well, too, so we can get some uh, some attention to them. So if you want, you can pick whatever guitar feels the most comfortable. Do you have any other guitars that you want to show us? No, no. These are the two, the two, the two Kramers I have so far. I okay. I, I have an eye on a Pacer that I I want to turn into a project for myself in the in the near future. You know, my own painting scheme, and I'm gonna install a Planeton pickup here. And, original Floyd. I want it to be my own Frankie. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah. One guitar I think you would probably love to death is one that I have. We probably can't see it on the camera right now, but the Vintage Pacer Deluxe, they still have some of those. They did the special ones in 2015 and they're still available um, in certain stores in, like the, in the Metal Flake. And I'm telling you, that guitar just feels so comfortable. Dual humbucker, um, you know, three-way position with coil taps and everything like that. It just, uh, just absolutely a, a, a dream guitar to play, a shredder. And when I got mine, see, I'm not a floating Floyd guy. I was a floating Floyd guy back in the day. When you talk about the early uh, Ibanez and things like that, of course, those things were all, all floating. I had like the RG750, which I missed to death. I really want that guitar back. It was kind of like an ice blue or a periwinkle color. I want that guitar back. Had the shark inlays, whatever, shark fin. I had the gems. I had a, the Gem 77 whatever floral pattern, and I missed that to death. Those were all fl uh, floating uh, trims, and it, it was almost sacrilegious back in that day to change them from, from floating to, to flush. But now, when, when this one arrived, it was floating. I thought, you know what? I need to keep it this way. It's a special guitar, and I will adapt my playing to this guitar. And the funny thing is, I've compensated for this guitar, like for the floating, and it's made me better because I've changed my mindset I haven't, like, I mean, I rest my palm heavy on a Floyd. It's like it's there. I actually have some spots where I've kind of tarnished the Floyds from resting my hand there. And I can baby it on, on the floating Floyd, and I, I really didn't even think about it. So the guitar has been a, a wonderful asset to me, and I think you'll like that one a lot too. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lots of tone options, like what you said, like you just said. Yeah, exactly. So before we go back to the chat, we're going to do this now so we don't um, we don't disturb your neighbors. So I'm not going to put you on the spot. You can play whatever you like, but I'm going to tell our fans right now what you're going to hear is going to be good. Uh, Phoenix gave me a couple little um, riffs off the air and as we were just testing some levels. And, I mean, even her worst note is better than my best note that I'll ever have. So I want, hopefully I'm going to take some of the pressure off you here and just have some fun for a few minutes and, and show us uh, some of your special tapping riffs and all that kind of goodness. Thank you, thank you. Let's have some fun here. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Amazing. That was good. That was really good. Thank you. Thank I, you. I got to think, I, I wish I had the paper in front of me. I have it. It's over on my printer right now. I got a bunch of PDFs over there that I printed, and some of them are years. There was like a weird three note per string arpeggio thing that you were doing. It was a tapping thing. Um, do you remember which one I'm talking about? I, I don't want to bring up your YouTube channel right now and, and mess up my computer, but there's a lesson you did. It was kind of like a three note per string tapping thing. It was really crazy and advanced stretching. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Oh, I believe it's the it's the tapping lesson I did for turning the the pentatonic scale yeah. into a three note per string scale. Yeah. That's something I I always do because I like the dynamics of the pentatonic scale mm -hmm. turn it into a three note per string scale. Can you show us because that? Sorry? Are you, are you able to show us that one real quick before we pack up yes, the plane? Yes, yes. Okay. The idea, the basic idea is, is like this. Because we have this box here, but we can combine boxes of this scale and turn it into a scale of, of its own, like... insane that's it that's the one exactly <laughs> and i worked on it for a few minutes i got frustrated and i put it back on the printer i didn't crumple it up and throw it in the garbage even though i was that frustrated that i couldn't do it <laughs> but i, no, I it's still it sitting did. over there yeah i'll work on it but it actually it was getting me to stretch which was a really good thing and i think that's a, even if you were to take it and use it for a warm-up exercise is phenomenal getting that pinky yes. out there stretched and using the proper fingers per for per fret because a lot of us tend to cheat you know and the pinky is almost forgotten and i think that's maybe one thing maybe you'll you'll share some um comments on that getting that pinky to work in in conjunction a lot of us tend to like take the easy way uh, easy way out and you need that yes the i believe that what we must do while practicing the guitar is to work on what works the best for us, of mm -hmm. course, but we must never for forget what we can do, our weaknesses. That's right. Because it becomes a, a habit. So it's better to push ourselves a little bit. Now, just to overcome that fear that we'll never be able to play something because my pinky is not strong enough. Right. Or, or I can play clean enough, so let me cheat on something here so the trick is always it's hard it is because playing guitar as you know it's a hard road right it is it is the man and every day we set we set our, ourselves a different challenge but it's good to face that 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 storm mm -hmm. and that storm on your daily practice because in time you will see that it's not so ugly that it's not so hard that's right and when we barely notice, we will be, be, be playing what we thought was in, in, impossible, right? Exactly. Well, I, I look at it like this too. I'm terrified of roller coasters and certain rides at amusement parks. I can only do like a Ferris wheel and that's the only thing I can do. And I think I, what I need to do every once in a while, because the family here, they like to do these scary thrill rides. And I'm, ter I'm terrified of it. I'm not afraid to admit it, but I think once in a while I need to hop on the scariest roller coaster and face my fears because... You know, then you can embrace things differently. And the same thing, same thing comes with guitar. You need to, like, maybe you don't, like, okay, for example, I'll use myself. I cannot sweep pick to save my life. 
and I've and I've gotten really mad at myself because I'll watch some of these guys like the Paul Gilberts and the Rusty Cooleys and the Jason Beckers and you know the you know goes on and on and on right and I can't do that and I'm, I get frustrated but I think what we have to do as as guitarists out here and musicians is shoot for the stars and aim for the stars and never stop going for that but also like don't be overconfident but say to yourself you know watch what some of the things you're doing and say okay I, i'm happy where i am you know i i am going to get better someday i hope i really do and i'm going to work for that but you need to be happy in your own spot right now too because even the person who's the worst guitarist out there he or she may share some of their licks with friends and that friend is going to say wow that's awesome so everybody's awesome is a different level, right? Yes. One one thing that I I always tell to my students is that no player sound like the sound sound like the other. Right. For for example, we have Joe Satriani, which is an amazing player, mm-hmm. but he doesn't sound like Vi, who doesn't sound like Ingve. Mm-hmm. Everyone is great in their own way. And all of them have a trademark on their playing. That's right. So you were talking about Paul Paul Gilbert. He does a lot of string skipping arpeggios, right? Mm-hmm. Once I saw one of his instructional videos from back in the day, and he was saying that he doesn't play sweet picking very well. Oh. So, he's, but he still wanted to play arpeggios. So what he did? What did he do? He adapted a technique that would work the best for him but he, he will still be, be playing arpeggios but only with a different technique that suits him better that's what I, I i always say you have to push your limits a bit harder but you also have to have your own trademark while playing that's right for instance red beach he, he's amazing at playing tappings and Ingve is great with alternate picking. Everyone is great in their own way, and that's why this type of music and eighties guitar was so big because everyone was distinctive on what they did. So I think it's a good advice for today's musicians to look for a trademark sound for them and work on it. Of course, always do the research the basics the basic research and always want to learn more because you can always improve what you do but look for your own sound your own voice on the guitar that's right and because you mentioned paul gilbert this is something i'll share with some of the you know people that are just starting on guitar and maybe frustrated even if they've been playing guitar for years as paul gilbert said I mean, it's hard to imagine Paul Gilbert struggling with learning guitar solos i mean it really is hard but that goes to show you how human he is is the fact that he struggled with almost every guitar solo when he was a cover artist and he knows so many cover songs but he struggled with learning the solos never got them right van halen everything and that that turned him around and gave him his own style because he had to adjust and compensate and you know kind of change things around to get close to it and that's what made him what he is today so if that can give one piece of advice we'll share with everyone is the fact that you know have fun and try to get the best that you can if you can't if you can't hit those notes you know even if you hit the notes people are going to judge you anyways because they're going to say well you hit them at the wrong time you didn't vibrato here enough you didn't dive here enough just have fun with it and even if you are missing the mark you're going to develop your own tone and, and your i mean your own technique as you mentioned and uh your one day i, I think you, you probably found this with yourself one day all of a sudden you found a technique is like oh this is me now i've been following these guys all these years guys and girls but now i have my technique right yes you have your own voice it's like when you hear steve vai he doesn't sound like anybody else he sounds like steve vai that's right you have a lot of musicians who are influenced by by him i've always thought that red beach was influenced by steve vai's sound but he, he doesn't sound like vai you can hear that that influence on him, but he sounds like Red Beach. That's right? right. Yep. The way they approach your instrument, the way they attack, the way you know, we've talked about this in other shows before too. Like, you know, you could take a same same. I could take a guitar, match the same string gauge, match the same amps, the same pedals, whatever, and you play through it, and you just don't get it because it's all in the hands. Yes. That's right. Yes. 
that's true. I'm going to jump because back to the chat for a second here, just for a quick second, then we're going to come back and ask you about some amplification here. Uh, so we've got your SoundCloud now in the uh, in the chat uh, from Nocturnal Butterfly. Dave Byron says metal and classical guitar go together uh, so well. Love the show. Um, Terry's GG and G is here. Hey, everyone, a special one to Phoenix. Um, Quentin James is here, and he's a great guitar player. Great shredder. Says hey kids. Uh, Dan Halen says can't do better than a Kramer. Um, let me see here. This is really funny because Terry sent me a message one day. This is really funny. He sent me a message and he says, here's his comment first. He says, I'm still laughing about how I was trying to get her on here uh, with <laughs> Eric. Meanwhile, Eric already started <laughs> doing it. He goes, yeah, Eric, you got to check out this great guitar player, uh, Phoenix. Um, um, you should get her on the show. I'm like, awesome. She's coming next week. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's funny. That was pretty oh. cool. Uh, let me see here. Uh, James St. Mar says that's what made me discover Kramer as well. Saw Reb Beach with one of Ed, uh, with one and Eddie, of course, on YouTube videos. Uh, OU812 says I love that guitar. So we're referring to one of the guitars that you were playing momentarily ago. Okay, here's a good question from Grilled Chicken Salad. I, I like that. I like that name. I actually I'm hungry for a grilled chicken salad right now. Um, yes. This because it sounds pretty good. Um, but Phoenix, do you know if that's a German original Floyd Rose or a Floyd Rose 1000? I'm thinking an FR 1000. Would that be correct? It's an FR 1000. Yeah. I believe Kramer is working with them since Music Yo ended when they relaunched the, the brand. Yep. It's the FR 1000. Yep. In my humble opinion, it's just as good as the German one. Yeah, they sound they sound very, very good. Where, where I tend to... Where I tend to want to upgrade a little bit is when you get the Floyd Rose Specials. They're a much softer nickel alloy kind of thing, and I've seen this a few times with people. And this is not this is not referring to Kramer. This is referring to uh, many brands who can use a Floyd Rose Special. There's nothing really wrong with them, but the longevity of them can go wrong. I've, I've had a couple of people message me and saying, "Hey, I just ch I changed my strings once, and I stripped one of the you know the saddles." And I'm like, "Yeah, I, I I know where you're coming from because it's a much softer metal." You know, so the FR1000 is nothing wrong with that tremolo for sure. And we'll talk about down the road here tonight um, some FU tone, food, uh, you know, upgrades, which can really help the longevity and also the tonal aspects of the guitar. So there we go. That's the answer on that one. Uh, Mississippi Treasure Hunter is here saying, hey, all. Um, and Terry says, refretting is, is not fun or easy. And I agree with that. And one of these days, I'd like to try it. And I made a joke one time on one of my shows here over on the EVH show, I, th I had a brilliant idea when, when I was a late teen to make a fretless, uh, a bass I had, a bass guitar, just a court bass, so it wasn't an expensive one, um, and I thought, I want to make a fretless bass, and I'm not sure who I was watching back in the day, maybe Jocko or Stanley Jordan or somebody uh, who I was influenced by a fretless bass, and I thought, hey, to make a fretless bass, I just got to rip the frets out with some pliers, and it wasn't that easy. Then I started no. taking plastic wood it's and putting... Wasp, but no, but it's not. <laughs> it was a bad idea. Usually, here's a note to self. When I get a good idea, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's a bad idea. So <laughs> I won't do that again. Uh, <laughs> continuing on with the chat, FNAF Gamers is here. Uh, he built a nice Frankie I saw on social media the other day, which is really good. And uh, I missed a bunch of comments here. I scroll sometimes and I lose it. Uh, let me see here. Um, okay, this is cool, and I ha I know I, I have a feeling I know where you're going to go with the answer on this one. Uh, Dave Byron says, "Hey Phoenix, what do you think about the guitarist Tony McAlpine?" Uh, well, I have to say that he's one of my biggest guitar influences ever, ever, ever since I listened to Edge of Insanity and Maximum Security. I started to wanted to improve my technique on guitar and his melodies are so beautiful. He knows how to how to mix the the technical aspect of the thing with the melody aspect of the thing. He's amazing. amazing. Yeah, he is. And another humble dude, you know, he, you know, just a humble dude out there playing and you see him play like just the, some of the people I've I've had on the show before in various incarnations, Billy Sheehan, uh, Derek Shrinian, all these guys have done some jams with him, and uh, you, you, the guy can just jam. And that that's a great musician when you can watch. Like Another reason why I really, really, really love Joe Satriani, um, he's probably my second favorite guitarist next to Eddie Van Halen, that he can just improvise on the spot, especially blues. I mean, you want to take someone out of your element of your typical rock and roll thing and throw them into something a little different, and you watch him play, and that's what comes to, comes to life. And I think Tony is another example of that. Now, I, I followed Tony 
I don't know much about Tony other than his name and what he's done. I haven't listened to every single piece he's done. But what I did discover back in the 80s, like through the Mike Varney days and the Shrapnel Records and all that kind of stuff, it was obviously on my playlist a lot back then. But I tended to gravitate away from it because I just couldn't play that stuff. And I wanted to focus on things maybe I could play a little easier, like some ACDC and some things like that. Um, But it all comes back full circle. As we get better as musicians, we're like, okay, maybe now I can tackle, like I'm seeing some of my friends that are Van Halen fans, and now they're tackling Yngwie stuff that two years ago they would have never touched, but because they're practicing, playing, having fun, seeing daily improvement, like you'll see with your students, now maybe we can go touch that that uncharted territory that we would have never explored before. It's like we were saying that the things that once we thought were, were too hard to play, yep. in time they, we see that they become easier and we, we feel that need to try to learn a different solo, a harder, pattern to play or a harder arpeggio, you know, in, and once we dis- discover different music, like Michael E. Furkins, he mix this shred aspect of guitar with blues and jazz, and we also, we want to learn some jazz gu- guitar, some blues, mm-hmm. guitar, and it all adds more knowledge to our little mind encyclopedia, right? <laughs> Exactly. As a perfect example here, my my better half, Nocturnal Butterfly, in the chat, she's an amazing cook. And so you could take some dishes, maybe some Polish dishes and some North American dishes and some Mexican dishes and take some of these little sprinkles from different recipes and put them together. Now, what I'm trying to say by that is taking some of these musical styles, taking a piece from here and a piece from there, a piece from there, and come up with something really, really like, wow, this is amazing. Where did this come from? And it's because you're taking and absorbing a lot of different things. And I think that's another good reason why people need to embrace as as many styles of music as possible. Even if you're listening to in the car, one of the coolest things I think to do in a car, now we tend to listen to an iPod a lot because we don't even, in our, the newer cars don't even have CD players and things like that. So we listen to an iPod in a car and we'll play shuffle and stuff like that. But I think on the radio station, it's cool to almost play name that band and hit skip radio stations and listen to like, oh, that's cool. I think I heard that in the 80s and absorb all this new music because it will rub off on you. Yes, well, I try to to listen to as many styles as as I can. Lately, I've been listening to a lot of movie soundtracks because it has that that magic in it that it captures the essence of a, a character, of a person. Yes. So it was right around the corner when I started to write my original songs that I said, well, I want to put more feelings into my songs. I want them to, to tell a story, and I wish that people can hear them and identify with the story I'm trying to tell. Mm-hmm. So I start to pay attention on the harmonizations they use on music sound on music soundtrack on sorry on movies su- movie soundtracks, and it's quite similar to classical music, right? Mm-hmm. And going back to classical music, it's linked to guys like Tony Mac, O'Pine, and Vinnie Moore. So it's all a big family, no? Yeah. They're all linked together in one. <laughs> I agree, and I love the fact that you mentioned that with uh, with movie soundtracks. And here's what I think is the coolest part of movie soundtracks: it's not just like your typical, you know, if Aerosmith is going to be on the soundtrack because there's a meteor cramming towards Earth or things like that. I like the soundtracks where it's an instrumental piece. And the instrumental piece is the now the forefront character is the lead actor in that scene, because um, yes. the, you know the, the movies can only be as good as the soundtrack, and the soundtrack can only be as good as the movies. You could take Star Wars as much as I love Star Wars to death, and turn off the soundtrack, and you're you're left with a a pretty good movie, you know. And now you it's could, not, yeah. I have the same emotion with all that beautiful soundtrack from Jump. John Williams, yes. Exactly, exactly. So that is very, very cool. Get Watch soundtracks for different movies, whether it's a drama, whether it's a science fiction, whether it's even sometimes even maybe a crazy comedy, and look for yeah. the soundtracks that can ch- contain original compositions, and you'll find how music is now the forefront uh, actor 
in in that scene and really really draws your attention to it because if they didn't have that particular piece that's why some of these great you know uh, composers out there are getting work again and again and again because they're known for the emotion they draw people into it and uh, that's why they're working today Yes, and they capture the human essence, in my humble opinion. Yes. They manage to do that. They can tell a story with their compositions. That's right. And the most important thing of all. That's right, and that's where you, you know as a guitar player that you'll hit some notes sometimes in one of your original compositions where, and maybe it's even a cover, maybe you're doing a cover, but more so original, you'll hit a note. It might even just be one note, but it's that special note that has an emotion to it. Like I've done one solo where this is it's just kindergarten simple playing some notes but it's a climbing scale very slow and it's very emotional and every time you play it it just makes you you feel the moment and it's just the way you put you in the mood at that particular point and uh, you only have a few seconds a lot of times to express yourself and it doesn't mean you have to shred and get like 37 notes in there it just means you have to express yourself here's your chance to speak and when you do don't just say you know i like fritos you know, say something nice, right? And that's what was what, what, what actually captures the audience, in my opinion, of course. Once I was watching a George Lynch interview, and I think it was with Dave Navarro, it's on YouTube, and Dave asked him, how can you do that? How can you create such iconic solos? And they sound so melodic, but they're... They, they have so much technique on them. And George said, well, the secret is play with, with feeling, then mix some technique on the right places here and there. That's and cool. I think he's, he's right. Everything has its, its own place and its own time in music. The most important is that you're telling a story to people. That's right. And it's like watching a movie when you have that, that big action scene right in the middle in the middle of the story. That's when you add the shredding parts, right? That's right. And a lot of these guys will tell you as well, two guys and girls both will say, as much as they sometimes want to take full credit, while well, I hear I was thinking about this and I was thinking about that. Meanwhile, sometimes it's an, a very happy accident and it's like, you know, eruption and things like that, Spanish fly, some of George Lynch solos, you know, as much as sometimes some of these guys want to take full credit for what they did, an accident happened and they happened to be recording at the right time. Mojo was there and, yes. you know, magic happens. Yes, you reach that, that, that zone when there is no right and, and wrong. The, you, you have your feelings there, show, show, uh, show, show, sorry, show, showing up in the music yeah right? here's here's a <laughs> question here's a question i have for you which i didn't even have written down to ask you tonight but i just want to ask you this because i i want to see how you feel about this when you turn so let's say you're sitting there jamming okay and you're going to say okay today i'm going to do a video for youtube you're sitting there playing you're sitting there playing you're sitting there playing i said okay now i'm going to record it and i'll use myself as an example first and then and you can share your thoughts on that so i'll be fully confident i've got the solo down i'm playing and i feel really really good the minute the camera goes on, I feel like I just started playing guitar yesterday. Do you have any intimidation before you do your videos for YouTube? Oh, all the time, all the all the time actually. When I pre prepare a video for YouTube, when it's a cover, I have the 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 backing track rolling, and I play a first, a second, a third take, and then I have a hard time for which one I. <laughs> sucks the last so I can post it on YouTube, you know, but it's it's demanding for everyone once you hit the recording button, you know, it, it has some mojo in it that it makes us feel nervous, mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry, confidence, but it's very good to work on it because you will feel more confident to play in front of people and play in a studio. Right, it's the challenges that the guitar life brings to us that we have to overcome them one by one. That's right. I've even told some of my friends who do some live broadcasts sometimes, I say, take a piece of electrical tape and stick it over your little blinking red light or whatever it is, if that intimidates you that much. And I might even adapt that practice of myself because I need it sometimes. But put a little piece of tape over the light. So it's just, a, it's just a camera lens looking at you. It's not blinking. It's not saying you're live. And you go back and you watch it. Like all of a sudden, oh, okay, I can use that. That's not too bad. Yes, yes, that's that's a trick. Well, when I started posting videos on YouTube, I think it was back in 2012, 
I believe I, I used to, to be so nervous to post anything on the internet, you know, yeah. and my trick was to put the camera here and I never look at, at it. Never, That's a good idea. Because I felt like it was another person in the room looking looking at me. <laughs> That's a good idea. That's a very good idea. It kind of takes that, that thing away from you because, like, you know, as kids, we'd be in school, we'd do a public speaking, and you're up at the front of the classroom, and everyone is staring at you, and you're like, oh, my goodness. And, you know, you got to do a speech that's supposed to last three minutes, and you're done your speech in about, you know, 14 seconds because you're so nervous. So that's a really good technique, and I've noticed that now that you mentioned that, going back and watching a lot of your videos, you see that camera angle from a distance. So that's a really good technique. And you know what? Just advice to people that want to do these kind of things, doing videos for YouTube, you know, first of all, never be intimidated because we all come from the same place. Um, yes. you, never be, never be, a, uh, you know, never be shy. It, it's, you will be shy, but keep doing it every single day. And, you know, people that are thinking about maybe doing a YouTube channel, well, I've only got one subscriber. There's no sense in me doing it. Yes, there is. There is a reason to do it. Number one, it lets you record it's, it's a moment in your worth gold because it's a person supporting your playing exactly and think think of it yourself if you had never recorded anything on youtube you've now preserved several several years of your life on youtube you know you can go back and show family and you look back on yourself 10 years from now 15 years from now and say look how i evolved and even just yourself wow i actually evolved from here to here to here and thank god that i did preserve this because now I can physically see my hard work that I've, you know, in these tutorials and lessons and things I've done to get to the next step. Yes, it's a step-by-step -step process, actually, because like we were saying, we have to overcome many things, like lack of confidence on our playing, yep. shyness, but once time passes by, we, be, we become more, more confident, we start, oh, I learned a new song, or I wrote a song that I want to post on YouTube, and I say that to people all the time, don't let shyness overshadow your talent, because you never know what could have been of you if you give up now. That's right. And think of so, it this way. The shyest person in the world. <laughs> You've ever met, but I'm here talking to you, and, and it's great. It's it's awesome. It's fun because now we have an outlet to do this, and that's the thing. Most of us get into this style of thing, music and art, and because we are shy in our own world. We are the kids in the corner at school, you know, for the most part, that, you know, eating our lunch alone or, you know, playing out in the playground by yourself or else we're up tied to the fences by the bullies and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that's why we do what we do. So rule number one. Now we are our own drivers of our vehicles. Now we can take control of this. We can play our instruments. We can have some fun. We're going to share our stuff on social media for our own benefit. And if people happen to like it, that's awesome, you know. And then you get that feedback. Now, so I've watched a lot of your, many of your videos, and I really don't see, I, I mean, I have never actually seen negative comments. And we don't have to talk about, we don't have to go like down the road of the trolls and things like that, but do you get negative comments from here to, from time to time? And what is your approach to dealing with them if you do get them? Well, actually I'm very grateful because I have some very supportive people on my comment sections since mm -hmm. the first day I started posting videos on YouTube. But of course, along the way, you have the eventual troll. I'm not against uh, constructive crit criticism mm -hmm. because it helps a, a person to, to, to break out of a, a bad habit, but not trolling, that's bad. But the way I see it, if, some, if you posted a video on YouTube and there's someone there bothering you, you think that then you must be doing some, something right. Don't give up because of one person that, that, that's telling you that you can do that. Turn that into a fuel to your music, to, to your playing. Say, oh, I'm going to prove him wrong or her wrong. I'm going to do it much, much better. I'm, I'm going to improve. See, see this as something that may encourage you, you know, along the way to never give up on what you do. That's Never. right. Beautiful don't, advice. Don't give the right to anyone to say to, 
to you that you're not good enough or the or that you can do a certain thing. That's Nobody right. has that right. That's right. They cannot take that away from you. And usually when you get a negative comment, it's almost the, it's you can almost read between the lines and they actually love what you're doing but they hate what you're doing because they can't do it. And you know what? You could actually, I would just love to have this power to turn trolls around and say, look, you know what? You can do it. You don't have to hate me. I mean, I, you know, you might be frustrated. You and I might be frustrated with other guitar players and musicians out there that we would love to do what they're doing. We might not be able to do it. But if you could, if you could focus that energy in a positive way as opposed to a negative way and say, okay, well, you know what? Maybe I could practice a little bit. Maybe I could do that. Maybe one, one tenth of what that guy's doing. You know, instead of being mad and lashing out at someone, use it in a positive way, and it would so it would so better benefit yourself and your surroundings, your your well being, and so many things. Unfortunately, there's trolls that are trolls that will just never change. But I applaud you for the way you deal with it, and uh, it's nice that you have you know a lot of positive um, you know reaction in the community. I'm gonna go back to the chat for a quick second. We're gonna come back. Uh, I just want to say hi to a couple of people. Jamie uh, Trevino, The Law is here, another fine Kramer artist. And he's, you've, great, you've, great you've seen, musician. yeah, he's awesome. Got the hair and, and, uh, and the rock star yes. band. It's pretty awesome doing what he loves doing every weekend and getting some great gigs. Uh, Ricky Mees here uh, says, uh, got to love Kramer. It was my first guitar. Made me a bunch of money with it. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Tools of the trade to get the job done. And that's what we talk about a lot on the show is, you know, uh, you know, in the skilled trade set, whether it be, you know, if you're a plumber, you're a, a heating and cooling person, or you're a tool and die, or you're a musician, there are certain tools that get the job done. And if you can make money with these tools, more power to you. And it's all about efficiency. So that's awesome. Um, with what you love it it's priceless that's it's right. amazing that's right that's right uh chris link says she's an amazing guitar player uh dave yes. byron says always try to use that pinky it'll you'll open up doors i agree 100 percent um let me see here the losses i had a question for phoenix what is your favorite kramer guitar that you own or would like to own so that's kind of an open-ended question what would you think on that well i i have two kramers right now and i get torn between each of them because they sound so different from each other. Yeah. But let let me say for when I try to play some neoclassical music, I usually go for the eighty five. Okay. For the Van Halen stuff, I go for the eighty four. <laughs> and if I could have a Kramer right now, it would be a nice one. I love that guitar. Oh, there you go. And a lot of yeah, people have been talking about that. Ones. They're amazing guitars, incredible. I have the chance to play one once, and they and they perfect, perfect guitars. If if Kramer actually reissue one of their guitars from back in the day, I'd love to see the Night Swan being brought back to the stores. <laughs> yeah, I think you would do well with that guitar. I think that has like a certain thing for you. You'd be able to talk back and forth between two pickups and just kind of the look and feel. I, I think that would be a cool guitar for you for sure. And it's an awesome guitar. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an amazing guitar actually because I'm actually used to play with, with 22 frets. Mm -hmm. But I actually am a single pickup, but I'm actually willing to open it and exception to the night one. <laughs> Because they're amazing, simply amazing. <laughs> they are. And that's one of those things, too. You talk about intimidation factor. Here's another reason why if I was to build like an old-fashioned Kramer, uh, Kramer uh, Frank and, uh, Frankie, you know, like, you know, the uh, Us Fest era, that kind of deal, maybe a little earlier, I don't want a 21-fret guitar. So I people would, would attack me right away because, okay, Eric, you're doing a 21-fret guitar. But I want, I want the guitar to look cool, but I want to be able to play it for me, too. I don't uh, like 21 frets. And I'm not overly crazy about 24 frets, although I do have a couple 24 frets now. And so we need to get out of our comfort zones once in a while. But it is cool to have a couple guitars that are outside the norm that when you start playing, it's like driving down the road. It's like, oh, oh, I can't take that path today. I have to go this way. And you will adapt yourself and it'll make you a better player at the same time. But there's a question here from the chat. This is a question I had for you. And Les Bellin has the same question. So I'm going to give credit to Les. He's asking, what amplification do you use? Well, actually, my gear is quite simple. I have a Orange Crush amp, which which is a solid state, that I changed the speaker for a Celestion one. Okay. And my effects are from a Digitech RP five hundred. Nice. 
I've been using this for unit for about four years now. I got inspired by Jennifer Batten because she uses the RP 1000, right? Yeah. For some good six or seven years now. And I said, oh, she sounds so good live and she has that 80s type of tone. I gotta have this panel also. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> so when you record, are you, re are you miking your cabinet or are you just coming directly out of the jack to the computer? So sometimes, sometimes I mic my amp, mm -hmm. and but most of the time I go straight to the Digitech, to my laptop, going straight to Reaper. Perfect. It's quite simple, actually. Yep, because I can imagine a lot of times, too, when creativity hits you, you can't say at 2 o'clock in the morning that, okay, while well, creativity's hit me and uh, I have to wait until the neighbors wake up and get breakfast and coffee, you want to be able to record. So that certainly will allow you to do that. Yes, yes, I put on my, my headphones and start recording my ideas. And it served me well because I tried to record with other softwares before, but they were giving me some very, pretty bad latency issues. And I wanted to re record my, my, my music without having to worry about the stack side of the thing. So I went for Reaper, which is simple. It's a simple rig. Mm -hmm. And at least for me, it gets my simple job done. <laughs> That's perfect. And latency can be a killer for, for the, the buzz or the vibe I instantly. If you hear a couple, even a couple milliseconds for a lot of people, it tends to throw you off. I remember back in the day, I had a Digitech Whammy, one of the original series of the Whammies. And I love that pedal to death, which a lot of people did, you know, and use it for Steve Vai's and the Satriani's and Tom Morello and all those people. I mean, a million other people. But even when the pedal was off, there was a latency in like what I was hearing. And on a live stage environment, you know, it just drove me crazy. So the less you can cut out what you're hearing to your ear from the minute you hit that guitar string is, uh, is, a, is a blessing. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, That's for, sure. for sure. Over in the chat, Chris Link says, Phoenix is an incredible player and she loves Kramer's. I'm in love. Uh, Dave Byron says, I agree, Eric, because everyone has their own unique voice but never forgot melody. Uh, Neil Banbury here says, that's all good and well, but I'll go on a limb and say Lil Wayne is a terrible guitar player. Um, yeah, Lil Wayne is not the world's greatest guitar player. Um, have you ever seen Lil Wayne play guitar? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I saw that. I yep. saw that. Maybe, maybe guitar wasn't in his, uh, his skill set, I would like to say. So Lil Wayne has enough money. He can hire a really, really good guitar player. Yeah, he could reach out to you and, um, you know, he could hire you to be on tour. But, yeah, I always like to try to be as positive as I can with everybody. So I'll just try not to say anything bad about Lil Wayne. But, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little different out there. So you can probably raise the bar a little bit when it comes to shooting for a higher guitar heroes than Lil Wayne. Um, uh, Dave Byron says, my strong point is having a fast and strong alternate picking thanks to Al Miola. For sure, strong and, and fast alternate picking. Starting, you know, and here again, I, this is so great that we keep going back to Paul Gilbert, but Paul Gilbert raises the bar when it comes to this. You watch him play when he's on my show. He, I thought he literally had a metronome, like a, a click a click box of some sort on the show. He was stomping his foot so loud, and he was so in time. He's probably more in time than the most b rhythmic uh, uh, metronome out there. Yes, and that's the and that's the result of many many hours of study of practice, of dedication, actually. Imagine the nights he spent practicing his, his guitar exactly. to reach that, that level Exactly. Today. Yeah, exactly. Yes. That's right. And there's a, there a couple other questions in the chat. People ask about the amp. That's from Grilled Chicken Salad, so we answered that question. Uh, Quentin James says, when I miss the mark, I just call it jazz. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those you know those sour notes it, right you just dental, get, right they used to say that in jazz <laughs> that's right that's right so that must mean i play jazz a lot i didn't realize i was a jazz guitar player because i'm making those accidentals all the time <laughs> it counts it counts it exists it's an accidental <laughs> that's right uh satch bogey here says uh yo phoenix i'm very excited to see what future holds for kramer guitars there's probably well, some good I things coming well, I think there, there have some sur some sur su sorry some surprises for us in 2019, right? That's right. Yeah. Because they have a huge following. They always had actually since since the 80s, right? And 
like Al John said on the last interview, that that they're preparing new stuff. They're working on their website again. Mm -hmm. They're back in, in action with their Facebook page. So I think we have things to good things to see next year, and I do hope so because they're such a great brand and they're part of my life as a musician as a guitar player that's right daily life that's right um over in the chat oh you went to says vinnie moore is also a huge influence of mine uh dave byron says yes you'll never please everyone you have to please yourself uh so you can uh play with conviction uh, zach thong is here one of our regulars on the show nice to have you here zach um, and this is a good comment from Neil Banbury. He says, my mistakes are made to avoid copyright issues. And that's the thing, too. That, there's a question for you. Do you, do, you, um, do you ever get flagged for copyright issues on, on your show? And I might have lost you. Hopefully we got... Oh, there, are you back? Are yes, you, yes. Yeah. Do, do you ever get copyright flags on your show? Sorry? Do you ever get copyright information? Like people saying, okay, you can't play that song. Cause, like if you're doing a, a cover song by Van Halen or, or somebody, do you get copyright notices and things like that? No, not yet, not yet. I got lucky in that department, but not yet. Yeah, well, that's good. Okay. And so that's what sometimes people will like what uh, Neil was saying. Some people will play like a sounds like Guns N' Roses or sounds like Van Halen. And it's so tough to, to do that because you want, to, you want to be able to play the riff, but you know if you do, then sometimes. So that's awesome. So hats off to you on that one. Uh, let me see here. I'm trying to met, see who else. Uh, Vinnie Moore. A lot of people talking about Vinnie Moore. Uh, Tom Vice, just a little FYI, the pitch shifter isn't a pedal that lowers the pitch on the Floyd Rose. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, so I didn't even know that as well. So there you go. Uh, thank you, Tone Vice, for, sh for sharing that. Um, very good to know, and I want to look that up when I'm off the air. Um, let me see here. Who else have I missed? I'm going to go over to the chat here one more time. Oh, yeah, for sure. Jamie says the uh, Night Swan uh, needs to make a return for sure, guaranteed on that guitar. Yes, a yeah. lot of fans want that guitar back in source <laughs> we'll keep our fingers crossed so you shared with me uh, as off the air too about students that you deal with on a regular basis so you're an instructor kind of tell us when you got into teaching guitar um how many students you have roughly now and maybe if students want to approach you young old or anywhere in between how they'd like to take lessons how they might be able to uh, you know achieve those from you well i started teaching guitar at the age of 15 at my own high school actually because they they were looking for a guitar teacher, and I had good good grades in in music while in high school. So the, the principal he reached me and said if I, if I wanted to teach guitar because at the time I was really into ACDC and of course Van Halen and all the teenagers like me of course they wanted to play the same the same thing so i started gaining experience by teaching them at my at my own school well now as time went by i got a job here at the conservatory and i also and i also teach via skype i have 17 st skype st students from all over the world i have even one from japan i was so stoked up about it that people in Japan actually reach over me for some lessons, and know, I'm very, very grateful for each one of them I have. Oh, that's fantastic. That is totally fantastic that you're reaching around the world and you're you've kind of giving inspiration to these uh, kids out there and you know not, not, not necessarily always kids, but just people that can connect with you around the world, like you say, and learn and go to the next level. Ah oh, yes. That's actually something I've always, I've always wanted to do, you know, because it's a hard process to learn the guitar. So I wanted to fast forward what I learn, what I can share to people, and I try to, to do my my best to share what I know on this instrument with people that's willing to learn. Yeah, well, it's very well said. And here's a question for you. Okay, so I've had a few um, women guitar players on the show before and, and more coming. I've had Jennifer Batten, who, you, who you've talked about, and I just love her. She's so amazing and such a cool human being and just happens to be a talented guitar player. Anita Strauss was on the show for a short show, and she's a, a shredder, got her own signature guitar with the Ibanez, which is pretty cool, the world's first uh, you know, female um, artist with a, you know, an a, a artist guitar. And Chelsea Constable's coming up on Friday. I mean, there's some women guitar players out there that are kicking many of our asses, including <laughs> myself. 
So I want to ask you, as, as, a, as a young girl going through the scenes that is often looked at, and this is not me saying this, it's just general, the industry looks at the guitar shredders as, when you think of guitar shredders, a lot of people tend to look at the guys first, and it's not fair because, like I said, a lot of you guys, a lot of you girls can kick our ass. So how, how was it for you growing up trying to get your name out there and um, maybe any advice you could share to some young girls that think, you know, I'm going to be the next rock star, you know, not the next female rock star, not the next male rock star. I'm going to be the next rock star. What advice could you share to them? And what did you struggle with if you did out as a young girl? Actually, my struggles, my str- struggles were actually to learn how to play and to import my instruments to Brazil. But... On this area of people having prejudice against me because I was a girl, I never suffered it. I know it it exists, it's out there, but I'm very grateful that I didn't suffer that here with me because ever since I started posting YouTube videos, I had a lot of support from people. And every time I wanted to work to do a better job, to, to 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 play better, so I never suffered anything like that. And the advice I give to girls out there who wants to play the the guitar are dedication, patience, love what to do, see every challenge you have on your way as a fuel to make you move forward. Never give up, be yourself and have fun in the process also. Because I miss this fun aspect of playing guitar, people smiling and having a good time. It's something that is needed on the scene. I agree. And we're seeing more and more women guitarists out there right now, like getting forefront, you know, front page guitar player magazines, guitar world, that kind of stuff. And it's to the point now it's like, okay, finally, thank you. You know, cause there are some incredible ones out there yourself in that same company. And, uh, it's, it's opening our minds up, you know, and we are becoming a more, uh, I, I, sometimes being politically correct can be a bad thing as we know with politics and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, it's nice to see, people getting the recognition that they've worked their asses off for years to get to where they are. And they're often, and, and that doesn't just uh, apply to music. You look at um, Hollywood. Hollywood is the perfect example. You know, uh, women actors are getting paid a lot less than male actors for a lot of the same roles. And it's like, you know, it, it's just not fair. And I have a friend that's in the movie industry who's a, as a showrunner and he's, he's an advocate. I mean, he will go down and he'll, he'll make enemies with his male friends for saying that, a lot of these women writers uh, and actors need to be paid what they're worth, right? And it's because nice that we're coming. There's no gender, right? If you do a good job, you deserve to have that rec- recognition, right? Exactly. Just like everybody else, yes. Yeah. I agree. There's a question in the chat from Neil Banbury. Uh, you don't have to be too specific about this, but he's asking, where do you call home? Because you're a different time zone from us. Where do you call home? Oh, Rio. <laughs> you're in Rio. So yeah, you yes. you alluded oh. to that earlier when you're talking about the import of maple. So yeah, you're in Rio. Very very cool. Yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, I've been complaining here about the temperature here in Canada. I changed my clothes today four times, um, and I'm not kidding. And uh, I, I'm, I I probably need to change for a fifth time right now. It's it's unseasonably hot here in Canada. What is your weather like on a daily basis over there? Is it dry heat all the time? Kind of hot? It's usually a dry heat all the time. Today it was an exception because we're having some rainstorms and it got colder right now. Like we're having some 40 degrees or so, but that's an exception. It's usually <laughs> 90 degrees the whole year. <laughs> 40 degrees is your cool time? Yes. Oh, yes. man. We, we, I think we were at about 30, actually about 30 today. And I was complaining about that. So I certainly won't complain anymore. But... I will say here in Canada, in North America, uh, humidity can be a lot higher. And I've been down south before, too, where you could be, you know, 40, whatever, extremely high. And with, with the humidity not being there, you can tolerate it. But the humidity, when you feel like you're walking through water, that's where it kills you. Yes, yes. It's like living in a sauna, right? <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> 
Uh, Terry <laughs> says, I've got no bias uh, to gender of guitar players or influences. And that's really cool. When we stop looking, when we stop looking at gender and race and just yes. enjoying what we see out there, uh, that's, a, that's a phenomenal thing. And it's hard. I, I, I'll admit, there's some guitar players out there. You know, I've, I've seen some women guitar players that could kick my butt. And you're like, you, you get kind of distraught for a second. And you're thinking, you know what? But she inspires me. And then I'm going to go learn, right? Like I said, printing out some of your PDFs from some of your lessons and stuff like that. I wasn't able to play them 100%, but I took a couple licks from them and uh, I felt really good about it. And so that's where it all comes down to. Just be, be inspired and not angry at the world. Yes. The best thing is to see people as individuals. Yes. You know? And everyone is here on the same boat, same type of sufferings and living this life here because this planet is like a, a prison right we can live here so we gotta live together here that's right for an amount of time so let's make the best out of it let's learn from each other let's hate each other less that's right and and people like yourself myself here and a lot of our mutual friends in the youtube community and the social media community we're sharing things because we love it first and foremost but, you know, a lot of a lot of people are enjoying it. And that's all we're trying to do is just have a happy, fun time. You know, like there's nothing more fun than music, whether you're pl no matter what the instrument is. And we get to share it with everyone and the, all the people that are in here in the chat tonight. It's so, so heartwarming to see these names again and again every week. And then some new faces, you know, quite often as well here, too. And it's just like, wow, this is so great. We're connecting, talking about guitar. How cool can that be? Yes, because one thing that I know is notice is that music it connects people right that's right that it brings people together it's something so so beautiful and that's why i think there's no room in music for hate or for division you know everyone has its own place because music gives a voice to everyone that's right and take away the the language barriers from country to country to country um you know you don't even have to yeah <laughs> You take you can take that with language away. Like if I was to speak to someone that was talking on the show tonight and and full uh, native Japanese language, um, I would not get what they're saying. Like I can understand Spanish a little bit. I can understand French a little bit. I have a very uh, predominantly French background. My mother was French, um, so I could understand a few things. But if I was to speak to someone in a, in a tongue that I've never heard before, and I would I, I would probably need some some uh, you know closed captions in the bottom. But once I started playing music, then I understand everything they're saying. You know what I mean? Yes. It's just like you're moving me 100% with your with how you're communicating. Yes, because music is like an a universal language, right? That's right. That's right. And you see those videos from young guitar with those great Japanese players, and we we don't read Japanese and we don't speak Japanese, but we can understand the that message there, right? That's right. That's right. And just just like language. Certain things you could you could have someone speak to in a language that you don't even recognize, but a certain word would say, "Hey, that sounds pretty sassy. I like that." What did you say? And and it might have meant, "I'm taking the garbage to the road," but the way they said it was so kind of sexy and kind of you know whatever that can apply in music as well too. Did a little yes. riff, whatever. It's like, what the heck was that? I, you know, we're from different backgrounds, but I really got what you did there. Yes, yes, music has that that power you know it translates into because music actually tr translates into emotion yeah this is a funny this is a funny a funny comment um the the user says i'm sucking wind is is their name says music is basically hidden sex talk <laughs> in a way it kind of is it's being yes. it's flirting yes. isn't it it's kind of a flirting way you know good playing some riffs whatever and kind of like whoa that was pretty cool yes yeah <laughs> to listen to certain stuff, yes. <laughs> that's right um so this has been awesome i want to ask you before we wrap up we're at 10 24 here just a couple minutes away from the end of the program um any plans future for you um maybe conventions nam anything like that i know you're still living every moment like it's fresh being a new kramer artist and you know being really excited about that um but what are your future plans for the rest of 2018 which we're kind of we're cruising Thank through you release my debut album next month in September 24th. It will be by Shred Guy Records. I'm quite excited about it because it's like a mark for me, you know? All these years of practicing and now I'm going to put my, my music on there. I'm quite happy with it. I'm also 
very excited because I may get to Nam next year. You're going to Nam for sure? I'm trying. I'm working hard here for that, you know? <laughs> well, that'll be fantastic. So, with the endorsements and all and everything that that it's 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 happening to me at the at the moment and I'm very grateful for it, you know. I may make it to Nam next year. So <laughs> Fingers crossed for me. <laughs> That'll be fantastic. And, and if that's the case, we'll look forward to meeting you in person. And uh, Junior, my son, Eric Junior, um, will be accompanying me as well, too. He's he's aspiring. He's a great YouTuber as well. Um, you know, he's, he's surpassing me, actually, uh, with what he's doing. But I'll, you know, I'll introduce you to him, and we'll try to get an interview with you at the Kramer booth, which is going to be great. And, um, I mean, regardless of that, I'm just looking forward uh, to you getting there and having some fun and, you know, you're going to have a great experience reaching out to some of these other manufacturers out there and, you know, get out there and network. It'll be a great experience for you. And by that time, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people do know about you and just have fun. Go out and play some guitars, play some amplifiers, play some pedals. And uh, it's going to be overwhelming for you. You're going to consume a lot in a very short time. And uh, you, you're probably going to go home thinking, what did I actually see until you kind of look back through photos and things like that? Yes, yes. Yeah. It'll be a great experience for sure. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> In the chat here, um, I'm, uh, I'm Second Wind says, I love old Kramer guitars. And the Gates of Babylon says, uh, it's a damn exciting to see Phoenix get this well deserved attention. I've been watching her since the beginning. So awesome. That's, that's very, very cool. Um, very excited to have you here. And as, as you were mentioning off the air, this, is this, this was your first interview that you've done per se kind of thing? Yes, yes. That's my, my first one in live. That's why I'm super nervous. Hey, <laughs> that's right. Live can be live can be either a success or fall on your face. And I think we I think we had a great time tonight. I think it went really really good. I hope you had a good time, and I hope it was able to make you feel a little bit comfortable and you know a little bit more relaxed. For sure, I felt like I was among friends here. Awesome. Well, you you are. True. You are amongst friends. That's one of the things I will definitely reach out to you to come back on the show. Uh, you have an open invitation to come back, and you will find from the right. people in the chat here, you can watch this chat later. You can see, you know, 99.999% of the time, people are very, very kind here. And the only time that ever it goes a uh, you know, awry is if a troll comes through, and that happens. But our, our people take care of them very quickly. And people love you here. They, they love what we do. Um, I'm very happy to announce this new show, Kramer Corner. It's been a lot of fun. And oddly enough, it's of the three or four three or four things we have in our merchandise uh, um, boutique. We have it. We have this new merchandise called Broadca Broadstash Boutique, Broadstash.com. The Kramer Corner has been the top seller for shirts, so I've, it must be the logo or something. So really excited to have Kramer Corner episode two more to come. And it was a pleasure to have you here. Um, all your links are down below in the description. We've been uh, Nocturnal Butterflies been posting them in the chat. It's been awesome. So I am thrilled to have you here i hope you had a good time i had a great time actually it, it was great being here thank you for the opportunity actually it was great because i've been following following your show since the beginning actually because that evh love we we all share right. and it's, it's like surreal for me to to be here well it's <laughs> an honor it's on, honestly, it's it's not that big a deal. It's it's really cool. I, trust me, I'm just as excited to have you here, and I, I as well. I've been following your stuff. You know, I comment on your videos. It's been a great inspiration, and that's what we need to do. We need to support one another. Uh, you have the support here in the channel. Chris Link says, Eric, please tell Phoenix we love her. You have the support. Well, thank you. So thank you very much. <laughs> keep doing what you're doing, and everyone, please. Not only subscribe to Phoenix's channel, but make sure you hit that bell and turn on post notifications. Even when sometimes people turn on post notifications, they don't get them. However, you're certainly going to get more notifications than if you don't turn them on. So links are down below. Subscribe, share the love, support. And I know Phoenix would love it as much as we will here as well, too. Um, and uh, I'm Sucking Wind says, uh, hoping to see you here at NAM. Uh, Terry's GG and G says, glad Phoenix and Eric... Uh, uh, glad Phoenix had Eric has her first live stream and Chris Link says I want a Kramer Corner shirt you'll see the links in a second broadstash.com they're available there's all kinds of different uh, uh, things available you'll see that here in a second Zach Thong says later Eric and Phoenix uh, Nocturnal Butterfly says thanks everyone take care and chat soon and thank you Nocturnal for all the great links and running the chat as cleanly as you always do Sean Close says go get the green one we're getting a lot of last minute comments so tune in again we're back so here's the deal 
Kramer Corner is now its official home on Tuesday evenings, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. EVH and Gear TV will reside at its normal time at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6, 6 p.m. Pacific on Fridays. This Friday is Chelsea Constable, another phenomenal guitar player. And then Helix Hour will return, if, if all goes well, the week after this Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. And don't ask me how I find time to do all these shows, but it's an absolute pleasure. I would much rather be busy going crazy talking to cool guitar players like Phoenix than doing anything else. So, Phoenix, don't go away. I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air, and we're going to call this an evening, and we'll see you next Friday. Everyone, get through that work week. Have fun. We will see you on Friday. It's just around the corner. See you real soon, and watch for that merchandise link coming right up. Cheers. everyone thank you so much for watching and don't forget to check out our full lineup of kramer corner merchandise available for purchase right now at broadstash.com <laughs>